السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات وسیم ایس اینڈ ویلکمس یو ٹو لیکچر نمبر تھرٹین آف مارکیٹنگ فار نان پرافٹس ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو ایٹ ایٹ دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان دی کمپوننٹ آف لرننگ از گوئنگ ٹو بی بیسز آف سیگمنٹیشن وی آلریڈی نو دا واٹ آر دا فیچرس آف دا ڈفرینٹ سیگمنٹس ان ادر ورڈس دا واٹ شوڈ بی دا کیریکٹرسٹکس وین وی ڈرا دا سیگمنٹ لائنس نا دا کوشچن از دا واٹ شوڈ بی دا بیسز on which we should build these segments. There are so many different factors that we take into account to define the segmental lines and then to refine them. But uh, before I get into the details, uh, let me tell you there are uh, two uh, sets of measures that uh, the marketers could generally consider before they get down to the process of uh, defining the segmental lines. The reason that we get into segmentation is because we want to reach our target market. That's the key statement. If we were not to reach the target market, there would be no need for segmentation. So in other words, all the features that we have learned, the meaning the feature of mutual exclusivity, exhaustiveness, measurability, substantiality, all these features will add up to a zero-sum game if we were not in a position to reach our targets. So in other words, two of the features which are known as reachability and responsiveness are the most important features. And it is for these two features that we undertake all the exercise of segmentation and then draw lines and then come up with uh, appropriate uh, ingredients of uh, the marketing mix uh, to come up with the right strategies to complete our mission. Therefore, Reachability and responsiveness are the factors around which we knit uh, the basis of uh, segmentation. Like I said, there are uh, two different sets of measures which marketers generally deploy when defining segmental lines and further refining them. The one is known as objective measures, the way as other one is known as behavior specific measures. Well, as the terminology goes, objective measures are uh, supposed to be quite very reliable measures and uh, they are uh, the ones that have generalized applicability because they basically dig into demographics. And uh, demographics being uh, the age factor, the generational characteristics, income level, education, religion, um, ethnicity, and so on and so forth, provide us with uh, some traditional accurate basis on which we can build our segments. The other uh, set of measure, which is about uh, the behaviors, uh, automatically means that, uh, that those are very specific to specific situations. And uh, which essentially means that we have to look at uh, a specific behavior in order to decide uh, what segment that should be really formed on the basis of that particular behavior. And needless to say, uh, these measures could basically are a reflection of psychographics, about which I'm going to talk a little later. Among the uh, demographic uh, the measures uh, that we know, age is uh, the one of the most time-honored and established uh, the way of uh, looking at uh, a group having similar uh, characteristics or similar features, similar interests, similar values, may show similar behavior. It is on the basis of age that uh, we are going to classify who is going to qualify for being the resident of the nursing home. Generational features are uh, the very interesting uh, basis of segmentation uh, because they represent a certain uh, the set of uh, beliefs on, on part of certain generations. Uh, for example, the generations of 60s and 70s 
that they may be more inclined toward making donations to all those causes that fight um, serious ailments. In the way as uh, the generations of 30s and 40s may like to uh, donate for those causes that deal with uh, the environment protection. And this is just one example. So uh, we look into uh, all these features in order to draw lines uh, between uh, those groups of people uh, who have dissimilarities. But when they are put together, they have a lot of similarities. The other one uh, could be the, the income level. And uh, we can take a look at uh, the income level from two different standpoints. Uh, the one is uh, from the customer standpoint, and the other one is uh, from the donor standpoint. And to give you the one example, we have to bring in uh, to play the factor of income level when we get into classification of different households as to who are going to get free food and who are the ones uh, that will be given uh, food at a subsidized price. Any the further subdivision of the segment into sub-segments is going to entail application of the same principles of drawing boundaries between different groups when it comes to defining further sub-segments. Let us now take the second standpoint, which is uh, about the income level as it relates to uh, donors. You are going to have to take a look at uh, the, the behavioral patterns of uh, your donors in relation to the amount of money they give uh, toward uh, the cause and the frequency with which they give. The point here is that uh, you get into segmentation not only with regard to your customers or meaning uh, the subjects of uh, the program, the target market, so to say, but you can segment uh, the whole audience or the audiences that you're dealing with. May those be activists, the volunteers, the donors, or anybody else, meaning in addition to your real customers. There is yet another basis of segmentation as part of the demographics, and that is ethnicity. It is a very interesting basis, and we like to bring into force whenever we think that we have to uh, undertake a medium of understanding for a particular population. And uh, we like to uh, come up with communication campaigns that uh, represent uh, their particular language and uh, reach them with the help of uh, the multimedia, which could be like newspapers, television, um, or even moderators. Language is a big force and uh, the great uh, communication enhancer. Uh, it really actuates the people to respond. And uh, we know that the basic objective of uh, coming up with basis of segmentation is to reach people and to have responses from them the way that we want. Another basis of uh, segmentation could be geographical segmentation. We know that uh, the people living uh, in one particular geographical area tend to represent the one particular set of uh, the habits, interests, and behaviors. And therefore, we can take it for granted that most of the people living in one particular area will come up with responses which are similar. So in other words, those people could be lumped together in one particular segment. The moment we find that we have people within that particular segment who come up with different responses, and there is a, there's a very vivid, divisive the pattern of responses, uh, we have to divide that population into two different segments or maybe more different segments. But the point here is that uh, the geographical segmentation also has been a traditional, well-established approach toward making segments. In developed societies, uh, there is uh, organized data available uh, in terms of uh, the demographics and uh, their uh, the usage patterns and so much so that you also can lay your hands on their media habits. But that is not the case in our society, and therefore we have to resort to the concept of what marketers call geo-clustering. That also boils down to geographical segmentation, but without the kind of organized data which is available or which may be available in ready-made form. You tend to move forward with the supposition that the people in that particular area, the world tend to exhibit the behaviors 
and uh, interests uh, which are rather common and which have a lot of similarities. It is because of that fact that uh, you may like to totally eliminate uh, the one particular geographical area uh, from your segments when it comes to generating donations. And you may like to concentrate on another geographical area uh, which you think is highly fertile and uh, carries a lot of potential uh, for uh, the generating uh, the funds. Let us now get down to behavior-specific measures. These also happen to be pretty reliable. And the interesting part of these measures is that once you have unraveled different findings that you want to establish through research or through any other means available to you within the organization, for example, information systems, then you go back to demographics. So in other words, all the findings that you have unearthed could be related to the demographics, making your findings even more reliable, authentic, and valid. The very first one could be the social values and the family life cycle. Social values basically are a reflection of the different interests and habits and behaviors and values on part of uh, the certain groups of uh, population that show a lot of commonalities and similarities in terms of their uh, education, for example, uh, their income levels and their consumption patterns. So uh, therefore, uh, values, meaning social values, could be a very good basis of uh, the defining the segments, the meaning uh, defining the boundaries of the segments within which you have one group that is absolutely homogenized. And uh, you, through the marketing research, can establish the divisive values which become the basis of defining so many different segments. Because we are operating in a market which is differentiated and which is not homogeneous. And therefore, we have to have different groups and we have to have different strategies to approach those groups. And therefore, we should get into marketing research to unearth all those values that may become the basis of dividing different groups into different segments. Different social values represent different social classes. And the fact is that when different social classes are put together with the family life cycle, they give us further leads into segmentation. Now, the question here is, what is a family life cycle? So that we can understand the relationship of the social values, social classes, and the family life cycle. Family life cycle basically is a reflection of all those graduating points which are exhibited by different families while they move from one particular phase to another. For example, a young family of uh, the young professionals with small kids is passing through the one particular phase of life. And uh, in about 10 to 15 years, they will get into another phase, meaning they graduate from one point to another. The reason uh, family life cycle has uh, a great impact on the way that we uh, make the different segments, or rather define different segments, is because they have different priorities uh, in life while they graduate from one phase to another. Uh, to give you one example, a young family uh, with uh, the very small kids could may be more apt to donate to your cause than a family which is um, in um, uh, the middle age and uh, which has uh, the greater responsibilities of educating their uh, children and doing so many other things in relation to their children and their future. And uh, conversely, a family that is uh, in its uh, later years or rather latest years and uh, it happens to be uh, an affluent family they will have absolutely a different kind of outlook toward life when it comes to uh, the making donations and you know what I'm saying. So social class uh, depending on certain sets of social values when um, connected with the family life cycle uh, gave us a lot of insights into what should be the basis of our segmentation. We may also look into customer lifestyle as a basis of segmentation, and this is the equivalent of usage and attitudes as we try to establish from time to time on the commercial side. You know from the commercial marketing side that the marketing people 
uh, almost on a continual basis uh, they come up with a program of marketing research that uh, is destined to establish uh, the usage patterns and attitudes of uh, their target market. Meaning, uh, if, there are ch if there is a change in the attitude of um, their uh, the target market, they should come up with uh, uh, appropriate fixes in terms of their uh, the strategic formulations and in terms of their tactical moves. Similarly, in the nonprofit area, we tend to study uh, what we call AOI, meaning activities, opinions, and interests of uh, the target audience. The reason I talk about target audience because I don't really want to confine our learning to just the customer's side. Rather, I would uh, take into consideration the total target audiences that consist of so many constituents that have to be integrated in order to fulfill our mission. Uh, therefore, we have to look into their uh, the lifestyles from so many different dimensions. The findings that we get through the marketing research, because this is an exercise that by and large uh, underscores the importance of marketing research and uh, tends to tag in that exercise in order to uh, establish findings that we are looking for. And therefore, the findings that we get could be uh, connected back to the demographics. And that connection makes our findings extremely valid and authentic. So in other words, the findings that we get uh, through uh, the study of lifestyle, for which we may also have to carry out marketing research, uh, is something that took the gives us a very solid basis, uh, which is a combination of demographics and psychographics, both. It is both because we first get into lifestyles and then relate the findings with the demographics. And that is how we find out how and why people go across the segmental lines and show the particular AOI. In the meaning, if uh, people from different demographic groups have a tendency to exhibit like, the behaviors, the meaning, activities, and their opinions, and the interests that have similarities, that we really uh, dig into psychographics, and uh, that we then determine as to why people from different demographic backgrounds behave in a similar way, and demonstrate those psychographics. The example of um, psychographics could be two different segments of the market, which you are trying to approach with one particular program. And in order to generate funds, you get into an exercise of a musical concert and a mafila milad, so to say. So in other words, you have two different segments and you have the same program, uh, the same cause, but it is the beauty of segmentation that we, you are dividing two different groups and you're approaching them through two different promotional exercises and generate responses that you want to make your program successful. Let me talk about a couple of more uh, bases of segmentation in relation to behavior specific measures. And those are occasions, uh, the use of status, the usage rate, the kind of features that we all are very familiar with from the commercial side, but in the context of uh, the nonprofits, uh, let me give you a couple of examples in relation to occasions, uh, we know that people tend to donate more during the months of Ramadan and Rabil Awal. So the implication for marketing people is that they have to have their uh, the marketing strategies and execution tactics all set to kick off uh, no sooner than these months approach. Segmentation can also be done on the basis of uh, user status. Uh, for example, if you are to kick off a family planning campaign, you can um, uh, they divide uh, different groups into like newlyweds and five to ten years weds and so on and so forth. And by the same token, you can segment the market on the basis of the usage rate. And this basically uh, talks about the intensity of the usage. For example, if uh, you are to undertake uh, an anti-smoking campaign, you can divide the market into the heavy smokers and uh, the light smokers. Uh, by the same token, you can divide the market into careless drivers 
and absolutely reckless drivers when it comes to undertaking a program that is meant to improve driving habits of people on the roads. So these are some of the, uh, the basis of segmentation that we take into consideration uh, while we define our segments. But like I always say, uh, that uh, we have to look at the marketing implications of uh, all the concepts that we learn. What is it that uh, uh, is going to be extremely strategic about the concept that we have just learned? Well, look at the, about segmentation, I think it is extremely significant that uh, we need to have different strategies for different groups of people because we know we operate in a market which is highly differentiated. In today's marketplace, we have people who show the different behaviors, the different habits, different interests. And the fact of the matter is, the ones that we have defined the one particular segment, in that segment, we may have people who exhibit the different preferences. And we may have to get into things like niche marketing and differentiated marketing. Now, these are the kind of examples which I'm going to give you as I, I go along uh, the uh, study of uh, the segmentation and then uh, the further into positioning. But the fact remains that uh, we need to put together uh, variables of uh, the marketing mix in order to come up with different strategies. And different strategies have to be formulated for different groups, meaning different segments of people. And we've got to see to it that strategies that we come up with are most appropriate for the market that we are approaching. So in other words, we are approaching our targets and we have to approach them to the way just about the most appropriate strategy, which is a reflection of our competencies and capabilities. This component of learning is going to be on an example. And I'm going to give you one example of segmentation. And uh, I would like to draw your attention to the word drawing segmented lines among donors of different kinds. So in other words, we are going to talk of for the different segments from the donor's side and not from exactly customer side. Let me emphasize here that uh, we get into the exercise of segmentation, not only in relation to the uh, ultimate target market, which is our customers, uh, we can get into segmentation of uh, so many different constituents who form a very uh, strategic uh, link or uh, a very strategic part of the whole chain. And therefore, uh, the donors can also uh, be divided into so many different segments for us to see as to uh, what really are the motivations uh, behind their making donations. And uh, those uh, motivations can uh, make them uh, different uh, the people. And uh, all those people who have similar motivations will form uh, one particular segment. And how many different segments can we form? This is a hy hypothetical example with the help of which I think the concept is going to be crystal clear about uh, the drawing the segmental lines. But before I uh, proceed uh, further, uh, let me uh, tell you here that uh, one of the authentic uh, bases of uh, defining uh, our segments is from within the organization, and that is our drawing on the data bank that we have in the form of uh, information systems uh, that we can uh, refer back to internal uh, the reporting system that we can uh, refer to uh, the market intelligence system and of course that we can get down to marketing research we can either you know get down to results of uh, some research that we conducted in the past or that we can get into some new research a new program to which in relation with the results that we had in the past that can give us further insights into how to um, define our segments or how to refine uh, the segments that we are already working with. Because we want to come up with very effective marketing strategies. We want to um, reestablish the, the position of our program, the meaning of a brand. And we want to see uh, whether or not there is a shift in the attitudes of people and in the interests that uh, they take uh, uh, toward our cause. So all these things uh, that could be unearthed uh, with the help of marketing research, which, uh, which again is uh, the part of the overall uh, the marketing information systems. So marketing information systems, MIS, uh, is something that we always uh, refer to in terms of defining our segments. 
And, and the fact is that uh, information that we get uh, through our reports is the very authentic and valid information. And therefore, the segmentation that we come up with, uh, the, by and large, is very valid and authentic. Now, back to the example. Here, we are in a situation uh, whereby we have to classify the different donors uh, based on certain motivations um, that they have uh, toward making those donations that they do make toward the cause. We think that we need to carry out marketing research. It has to be a comprehensive, quantitative research design whereby we have to come up with uh, a comprehensive questionnaire asking different kinds of questions to our respondents so that uh, we can unearth uh, some very important demographic as well as psychographic features. So in other words, we have to have questions uh, which uh, really give us insights into uh, what age brackets the respondents are in, uh, what are their income levels, and uh, what um, uh, the ethnicity that they have, if at all there is uh, the factor of ethnicity, and uh, uh, what kind of um, uh, social class uh, they fall in, and uh, the kind of uh, family life cycles they have gone through, or they still have to go through. In other words, could we have to ask all those questions could which could they give us leads into all those characteristics that uh, define uh, the good segmentation. And if you refer back to the, the characteristics of segmentation, you will recall that I'm talking here essentially of mutual exclusivity, of exhaustiveness, of uh, the measurability, substantiality, the reachability, and of course, differential responsiveness. So in other words, we have to put together a questionnaire with the help of a marketing research company, of course, uh, that uh, all those the questions uh, give us findings into uh, the features that I have just talked about so that uh, we can define our segments in a way uh, without any vagueness and uh, uh, without any ambiguity. Uh, the segments uh, have got to be defined in a very vivid manner. There has to be total clarity, no blurring of uh, the boundaries and total exhaustiveness. You carry out this marketing research and collect uh, a comprehensive uh, uh, amount uh, of uh, data and uh, you're all set to uh, analyze that data uh, so that uh, you can then um, get into the segmentation exercise. You apply uh, the different kinds of uh, statistical uh, techniques uh, the starting from uh, some very basic to maybe some uh, the very um, complicated and sophisticated um, in order to um, cluster the findings of the data in categories which are very appealing from uh, the standpoint of defining your segments. In other words, you have data in clusters that automatically um, tells you that this particular group has to be lumped together because they have the following similarities in terms of their demographics and in terms of their psychographics. Now, do not forget the objective, which is to establish what really it is that motivates them to make the donation. So you have uh, analyzed the data, you have all those clusters uh, in terms of interpretation, and you classify those into four or five the different uh, categories. The one is the regular donors, because this is uh, what you already have as part of your records. Uh, if you uh, dig out uh, your internal reporting system, uh, you will find out that uh, those respondents who already donate toward the cause um, are part of the system, and uh, you can double check that uh, from the internal systems also, who happen to be uh, your regular donors. So uh, you can classify those donors as one particular category. Now, this is not the end of it. If this was to be the end of it, you would have established that uh, through internal reporting system. But you here are trying to establish the motivation behind it. And motivation is going to be unearthed through different questions that you already have asked as part of the psychographics. And you find out that regular donors are the ones who 
shift toward the cause only because they know people who are either related to them or are their friends who have been cured by the program that you have undertaken. You are working on something so noble and you have cured so many people who are known to them that they have become regular donors toward the cause. So you can establish with a high level of confidence that those donors who know your target market, meaning those people who have been treated through a program of yours, are the ones who tend to be regular donors. And therefore, you are going to have a strategy which is going to reinforce their thinking into keep on making donations toward your cause. The second classification could be that of the casual donors. Now, this again is something that you have found through research, not through your internal reporting system, but any complementary data which you may get through those systems, you may lay your hands on that and see how you can draw certain correlations. But here, basically, I'm talking about your findings through the market research on the motivational side of making donations. So casual donors could be the ones who uh, make donations casually because they think that the cause that you're working on happens to be a good cause and somehow they have heard about it and uh, they think whenever they could spare uh, some um, extra uh, the money, they should uh, make the donation toward your cause. So here, the, your marketing strategy is going to be very different because this segment um, is the one that does not consist of regular donors it consists of casual donors, but you have the opportunity to convert this segment into regular donors. So therefore, your marketing strategy here is going to be a reinforcement of not only the casual behavior, but rather doing something which can really I'm going to push them up the ladder and make them become regular donors. That's where the catch is. And that's the beauty of the, the marketing strategy. And this beauty of marketing strategy is based on your findings. Because without that, you can come up with some strategic formulation based on very keen observations, but not on established findings. Your third uh, group of donors could, could be those uh, who uh, could happen to know certain volunteers, activists, or could, your staff members. And they say, could, we know could, the people working for the cause, and could, we know it's a good cause, and therefore could, we could, make donations could, toward this cause could, once in a while. And here, again, you have an opportunity, could, and could, you know what I'm talking about. The meaning, doing something so that could, you can create brand loyalty you can do something that people come into the fold of regular donors. And then you may have a classification of those donors who came to donating to your cause through a cost marketing relationship. You carried out a cost marketing exercise. You joined hands with a corporate entity because of which your cause got highly publicized and the people got to know about it. They started buying the product from the commercial side because it was making contribution toward the cause. And after the relationship is over, those socially conscious customers that happen to be your donors as well. So here, the strategy is going to be a little different in terms of its execution because you're dealing with the customers who are a little different in profile. And then you may have um, another very significant uh, portion of the market, which is yet another very interesting segment. And that may consist of people who have religious leanings. And you find out through research that um, here are the people who like to make donations because they think it is a religious obligation on their part to make those donations. Now, these the people, as the common sense goes, will keep on making donations, no question about it. But 
there is no guarantee that they will keep on making donations to your cause because there are so many different good causes and they have an opportunity of shifting their priorities toward another cause which they may think is even more pressing and is desirous of their higher attention in comparison to yours. And therefore, you have to come up with a strategy which is very relevant in that particular situation. So this is an example of segmentation of donors. And by this mechanism, you can get into an exercise that can draw segmented lines based on research on all those matters on which you may not have uh, complete information or very authentic information and you happen to be in a situation that you can afford um, a certain uh, the level of marketing research and you get into that exercise to establish all those facts uh, which uh, are going to strengthen uh, your program toward its fulfillment. So here again, the implication uh, for the marketing people is that uh, they have to uh, deal with uh, so many different segments. And all the segments they have um, defined and have drawn uh, lines within are the ones uh, that happen to be their target market. There has to be uh, a set of strategies that are meant for those different segments. And uh, for those strategies, there have to be the very relevant and appropriate uh, executional uh, framework. And uh, there has to be just about the most appropriate combination of uh, the variables of okay, the marketing mix that are going to be at play okay, when you execute those strategies. Okay, for example, you have to have okay, the mixed bag of uh, communication campaigns or a communication campaign okay, for okay, the one particular program. Now, depending upon the fact okay, how differentiated okay, your market is and depending on the fact how many different segments you're going to be dealing with, you come up with the different strategic dispensations. For example, if you are to undertake the anti-smoking campaign here, you are not going to deal with just one segment. Think about this statement. You're going to be dealing with maybe four different segments. And you know why and how? Because you may like to divide the population into two major segments, the one rural and the other urban. And the reason you divide the population into two major segments is because you have to have two different campaigns, the meaning two different communication campaigns in terms of reachability. I indicated you may have to deal with four different segments. I've talked about two, the meaning the rural smokers versus the urban smokers. But then you also need to have two different segments of volunteers and activists people who are going to help you with uh, their inputs to make people quit smoking. And therefore, you need to have a group of people who is going to uh, deal with uh, the rural segment of smokers, and you're going to have a group of, or a segment of activists and volunteers that are working for uh, the urban smokers. So in this particular example, what you really can uh, look at, very interestingly is you have one program and you have four different segments that you are dealing with. So this is a case of the one program, four segments. The beauty of the exercise of segmentation is that it lets us not only look into the segmental divisions, but it also lets us have a very good understanding of the strength of various segments. And when we know that variation among different segments, that we can come up with uh, appropriate strategies. Uh, that we know that uh, the strategy toward uh, regular donors is going to work very well, but then we have to do something uh, with the strategies that are uh, tailored for those segments that with less substantiality, so to say. Uh, the meaning the casual donors and uh, those who are known to uh, the volunteers and our staff members are to be approached with more intensity so that they can change their behavior toward making it regular and become our regular donors. And we also can draw further the causal relationships as we already have learned from the example 
as to the, what are the, the demographics uh, related to the, the amount of uh, donation they give and the frequency with which they give those donations. But the underlying factor here is that uh, we have to uh, bring into play um, the capabilities and core competencies uh, of the organization to make our strategies more effective. And uh, just to give you uh, a recall toward that concept, we need to have those competencies which uh, are not substitutable. So in other words, those capabilities which are very special to us, meaning all those specialties which cannot be copied by others very easily. And the way we can sustain those capabilities and that's what we call core competencies. And we make those core competencies as the basis of the strategies that we need to formulate in order to uh, improve our uh, segmentation uh, concept um, in terms of its uh, strength, in the meaning strength of different segments within the overall in the market. And we know that uh, the market is uh, highly differentiated. This is what I said earlier as well that we are operating in a very highly differentiated market and uh, we need to divide and subdivide different groups so that uh, we can pinpoint the various uh, values and characteristics and the interests and behaviors of uh, the people we are dealing with and uh, we can uh, lump them uh, in appropriate groupings uh, so that uh, we can um, have a strategic formulation that trickles down to that level that we are trying to approach in a very well-focused manner. That's the crux of, of the whole thing. We can say here that uh, the marketing has become so specialized that uh, differentiated marketing also leads toward the niche marketing. Here, the question is, why would you like to get into niche marketing? Well, the answer lies in uh, you're not having uh, resources the more than you really can deploy for that particular one niche. That is the precise answer. Let me give you the example of um, a nonprofit organization that may like to get into the cause of uh, protecting greenery, in other words, trees in the city, and uh, they may like to exclude another very attractive segment which you might call controlling environmental pollution. The reason uh, this organization may like to stick to one particular segment that is uh, conservation of trees and not uh, extending its um, operations into um, and one controlling environmental pollution is that this organization is very realistic about not having the compatible resources. So until the time that we have uh, a resource base and core competencies that uh, they really can the back up the segment or segments that uh, we really can serve that we should not be getting into those segments. And that is why organizations like to uh, specialize in one particular niche. So much of uh, specialization is taking place and markets are becoming so differentiated that, um, that we are moving toward the concept of customization. And that we know that once we have defined one particular segment, we may still have to draw certain distinctions between that so-called homogeneous segment and to make certain adaptations and adjustments uh, in response to the varying needs of the segmented population. Let me give you the example of um, a nonprofit organization that helps disadvantaged people acquire missing body parts. You are dealing with uh, the people who do not have major limbs, uh, for example, their legs, their forearms, or their hands, or their feet, and uh, the you as part of that organization are helping those people acquire those missing parts because that's the way the things are happening in the world today. So you may have to bring about certain adjustments in those parts because not everybody has the same anatomy. This is an example of meeting different varying needs within one particular segment by way of customizing. And this is a very important basis of the segmentation. With all these examples, uh, let me now give you a quick summary of uh, uh, the concept of segmentation because this is going to be the basis of all the strategies that we are going to make as part of the uh, business plan or for that matter, the program for the cause we are working for. 
that we first of all could have to be very sure about um, defining the segments in terms of um, the characteristics with which uh, talk about exclusivity, exhaustiveness, reachability, responsiveness, measurability, and substantiality, and so on and so forth. Then could we have to could we draw certain bases could we which take into consideration two could we major areas, could the one um, pertaining to demographics and the other two psychographics. And the fact of the matter is that a combination of both uh, could we use in order to make uh, could our segments uh, could very uh, separable could from each other. Uh, could once could we have um, defined the segments, then could we put together uh, different uh, strategies in order to approach those segments, because these are the segments that happen to be our target market. And target marketing is all about having the right groups of people approached with the help of the rightmost strategies. And it is that way that you are going to extract the responses that you are looking for. And segmentation, as I said earlier, is all about reachability and responsiveness. And this reachability and um, the responsiveness because they will not uh, make themselves uh, very prominent until the time that we have uh, divided the segments uh, very clearly, until the time uh, that we have uh, put together uh, appropriate strategies backed by capabilities and our core competencies. But once we have all these ingredients put in place, we are all set to go ahead with execution of our programs to make them a success.